some commentary in that period newspaper. A sharp tip from Fisher's bat in the third inning threatened to ruin catcher Charlie Poe's. Good looks, at least for a time. It hit him full in the mouth and extracted the tooth with more rapidity than elegance. Hastings demonstrated that the hurt did not disable the catcher by trying to steal second immediately after it even beautifully nipped by Hodes to wood. On Rockford, on Rockford, the newspaper noted, the new nine seems to be fortunate in the possession of an excellent third baseman, Anson, who will make Pinkham look to his laurels before the season is through. Concerning the rest of the nine, his charity is not to be inquisitive. Their score of 21 errors tells the story. As for the Rockford Gazette, the large number of our citizens were in the city and witnessed the game. All agreed that the game was very unfairly umpired, and that had our boys received fair play, a different score would have been the result. Was, did, did you find out like if the, the sports writer for the Rockford Papers was related to Hawk Allison at all? <laughs> yeah, or a distant relative. You know, uh, very possible. <laughs> might have been Hailson in the interview. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so moving on. May 24th in Cleveland was notable for the first of three Rockford home runs of the season. Coming off the first coming off the bat of Fisher Cherokee Fisher in the ninth inning to tie the score, Cleveland won 11 to 10 with a run in its half of the ninth. <clears throat> May 26th in Troy. Troy was late to show up when they hosted the Forest Cities, the New York Clippers says. The Rockford Nine put in an appearance on the Union grounds at the advertised time for the game, but owing to the non-arrival of the Haymakers, who had been detained by the getting ground in the Steamer, Connecticut, play was not called until 10 minutes to 4 o'clock. A few notables in the Troy lineup were second baseman Lipman Pike, very likely the first Jewish major leaguer, also holds the career National Association home run record with 16. Third baseman Esteban Steve Bayon, the first Cuban-born major leaguer. Also, catcher Bill Craver, who would eventually be banned from the majors for his part in the 1877 Louisville Braves game fixing scandal. Clipper adds, Fisher laid at the Haymakers, pitched for the Rockford Club, and did much better than he did last year while in the Niner the former club, but it's not good enough. Rockford lost 20 to 15. Clipper also, the Clipper said, it proved to be a long and would have been an uninteresting one, but the good batting of both nines. The errors in the field were quite numerous on both sides. The visitors somewhat excelling in muffing. <laughs> Next, the Forest City Club visited Boston for the first time and lost a pair of games. The familiar faces were in the Red Stocking lineup. Ross Barnes playing short, batting second. Fred Cohen batting, playing left, batting eighth. And Alice Baldwin pitching, batting ninth. Newspaper accounts occasionally refer to the Red Stockings as the Boston Rockford Cincinnati Nine. Not only did manager Harry Wright bring over three former Rockford players. We also brought in his brother George, Cal McVay's catcher, Charlie Gould, first base from the old Cincinnati Red Stockings, who went undefeated in 1869. Boston won the first game 25 to 11. The first home run of the season allowed by Rockford was by none other than Al Spaulding. Cherokee Fisher gave way to Denny Mack for the seventh inning on the mound, the first non-complete game of the season for Rockford. Mack would be the only other man to pitch for Rockford in 1871. There weren't many pitching changes in 1871 National Association Baseball. In fact, there were a grand total of 23 relief appearances all season long. Harry Wright and nine of them himself. <clears throat> June 9th, June 1st, 7 to 3 o'clock in New York. When the four cities visual visited New York on June 1st, Pony Sager was absent. The Rockford Gazette said he was somewhat injured, having played the first five games to short the next three left. Sager never appeared in the right, another regular season game. In his place was Al Barker, <clears throat> making his lone National Association appearance in the championship game. He had served as substitute <clears throat> in other games, but this is the only one he appeared in the regular season. Barker was the only member of the 1871 team from the original 1865 squad. It was Barker who, after the 1867 upset, the Nationals, he was captain at the time, was said to have proudly worn his uniform in public for the next two days. He was one for four to walk and two RBI in his lone game, one of 11 players in Major League history to have multiple RBI in a one-game career. Thank you for the baseball reference play index for that. After his baseball career ended following the 1871 season, 
Civil War veteran went on to a lengthy career as a dancing school teacher, band member who played the tuba, and a member of a quartet. He even umpired three National League games, all three Boston and Chicago in May of 1881. Two RBI by Al Barker aside, Rockford lost them. <clears throat> From the New York Clipper that, that the game recap. Martin of the Eckfords was umpire and displayed excellent judgment in his decisions, but also showed a lamentable ignorance of new rules in one respect considering that he is the captain of a professional nine, for he enforces the defunct rule of giving warning to the pitcher before calling balls and to the batsman before calling strikings. His repeated calls of ball to the bat and good ball, creating laughter as such calls have not been heard since 1869. This is also the degree, the debut of Dick Higgum, later infamous for being the only man to be banned from being an umpire in 1882, despite murky details as to why. Notables in the mutual lineup, Dickie Pierce often given credit for the baby hit or bunt. Joe Start, great first baseman, career dates back to the mid-1860s, played well into his 40s, was King Kelly's favorite player growing up. He should be honored at Cooperstown, in my opinion. And Bob Ferguson played second. Modern fans may have read about him as having the spectacular nickname Death to Flying Things. According to David Nemec's phenomenal Major League Baseball profiles, he was rarely called that during his day. He said the preferred moniker of the time was have a care, his vocal signal that something was afoot when coaching the bases in his captain. So the next game was an 11-10 loss, even though they scored more runs than their opponent, without Tony Sager, and the team were seemingly reluctant to use Al Barker regularly. Charles Chick Fulmer made his Rockford debut is taking over at shortstop. <clears throat> Bob Addy filled in his short previous three games. Fulmer was from Philadelphia and attempted to serve as a drummer boy during the Civil War before he was sent home when it was discovered he was only 14, according to the bio project by Peter Morris. He played at the Keystones in Philadelphia and four cities of Cleveland before arriving in Rock. Notables of Philadelphia, Dick McBride, probably one of the five best pitching careers in National Association history. Second baseman Al Reach, one of the first professionals, if not the, later a later sporting goods magnate, eventually emerged as Spalding and Company. Third baseman Levi Meyerly, according to Nemec, Meyerly simply could hit a baseball better, farther, and more often than any other player of his day. He tied with Troy's Lippman Pike and Chicago's Fred Tracy for 1871 National League home run lead of four. He was also a fielder. Rockford broke a 7-7 tie in the ninth to take a 11-7 lead. Philly then rallied for runs to make it 11-10, but that's where the game stayed. According to the game account, Meyerly made a couple of bad throws that gave the four cities seven runs. He also homered, typical Meyerly. <clears throat> June 16th was a notable date for the Rockford team, and it had to do with the dispute over the participation of Hastings. Remember he played for Lone Star Team in New Orleans as recent as April 16th, so he couldn't play until here. In July 8th, New York Clipper, a judgment of the Judiciary Committee was printed declaring all games forfeit. <clears throat> Newspaper accounts will continue to show uncertainty as to what counted and what didn't. Hastings, a Civil War veteran, despite only five months of service in 1864, is listed, listed in many sources as four city manager. What is strange about this is the fact that contemporary newspaper coverage rarely ever made reference to it. I would actually consider that Bob Addy may have really been the true field captain of this team. However, Hastings is referred to as captain once in all newspaper accounts I could find, that being September 30th, referred to as Captain Hastings. Anyway, June 24th was our first legitimate championship game with the Hastings 60-day ban over. Chicago, the Rockford visited the Chicago following 1883, allowing six runs in both the 5th and 7th. New York Clippers sang a familiar team. On the four, of the four cities, it was a loose and discreditable game, so loose to excite wonderment at their successes over the athletics. The nine is far from equal to that of 1870 and needs strengthening in the infield. There were several exhibitions mixed in, often listed in newspapers to list of scores. There weren't many accounts in the new box scores printed. But I will note that in a pair of exhibitions on back-to-back -back dates in June, Rockford routed the team from Kansas June 27th by a 71 to nothing score, then rocked the Caw Valley, Caw Valley 9, 67 to 11. He also played a few games in Canada, the game was locked, and the 13-12 win over the Maple Leaf Club of Guelph, the champions of Canada, according to New York Clipper, on July 1st. 
They later beat a Maple City team from Ogdensburg, New York, 78 to nothing in August. Also, noted was this. Sager, the left field of the Rockford Club, he actually played short mostly, fell violently ill and could not play, but his absence did not affect the result. This coming from one of the exhibitions. Uh, he, had, he, had, he disappears everywhere. Um, it's possible he could have been demoted to a role as a substitute. I'm not sure. But the man nicknamed Pony as well as Cricket. The bio project by R.J. Lesh and Peter Morris is fascinating as it is more about the quest to track him down than it is about the man himself. The next season contest was in the broad of Chicago against the White Sox. Clipper reported a crowd of 10,000. Four cities staged a late comeback. It was too little too late. The second Rockford home run of the season came in that eight-run ninth. It came off the bat of Gat Stiers. Garrett, <clears throat> Garrett Stiers is one of the heaviest hitters of pre-National Association baseball as well as 1871. Rockford discovered him playing for the Byron Nine. He joined the Rockford team in 1868 but missed the 1869 season with typhoid malarial fever. Perhaps with him, Rockford could have beaten the undefeated Red Stockings in 1869. Styers was back in action for 1870 in the lone Rockford season in the National Association. In his 55-part series on the team in, that ran in 1922, Horace Buecher referred to the Styers as the Babe Ruth of early ball. In his book, But Didn't We Have Fun, Peter Morris quotes a writer as saying, and every rustic stereotype ever invented was shoehorned into a description of the early ball player, early ball player, a donderum, I don't know where that game, name came from, Gat Styers, who came known as the terrible Hasey. Styers was the phenomenon of those days. He knew nothing of headwork, but he had the strength of a giant. The places under the arms where the shoulders join the body are usually hollow. In Styers' case, they were filled with muscles. The man could run like a deer and had hands like hams covered in hide. No fly passed him, and his fielding record was generally errorless, save in the matter of throwing. When he returned the ball to the diamond, it was always at lightning speed, and no one could tell whether the spear would reach the catcher or go far over the fair ground fence. But it was at the bat that Styers won his name as the terrible Hasey. He was not like Anson or Barnes, a sure base hitter, but when his club did meet the ball, the result was nearly always a home run. More from the Morris book. Harry Wright, according to the recollections of one of his contemporaries, once waded across his creek and climbed the bluff to retrieve a ball batted by the legendary slugger Gat Styers. Styers was only 22 at the end of October 1871, but that was all for his major league career. He went west, mining gold in Colorado, surveying land in South Dakota and Minnesota, farming and hunting in northwestern Iowa. It was said that he was present for the last Sundance ever performed by the Sioux at the Pine Ridge Reservation. When he returned to Byron, he wore his hair long in the frontier fashion. Styers died in Oregon, Illinois, in 1933, age 83. Then he went back to 1871. <clears throat> Rockford fell to 0-16 with those four fortunate wins on July 17th when they hosted Philadelphia. During a Rockford four-run first, Styers also made a terrific three-base hit, the ball bounding back off a tree in center field and preventing a clean home run. Rockford played the majority of its home games at the site of the Agricultural Society, where the Winnebago County Fair was held. The site remains a park today. Named Fairgrounds Park, when coming across references to these ball grounds, you encounter ridiculousness. Here are a few examples from Phil Lowry's Green Cathedrals. Most interesting and strangest major league ballpark in history. Numerous trees behind the catcher and along, along both foul lines made catching foul pop-ups impossible. Third base was up on a hill. Home plate was in the deep depression so that when tagging up from third to home, a runner was running downhill the whole way. All the way around the outfield, there was this first warning track ever. It was a deep gutter providing drainage from the adjacent quarter-mile horse racing track. Horace Buecher provided this comment to the Rockford Republic in 1922. Even in my juvenile days, that fairground diamond had more hazards than any respectable golf course. <clears throat> a Rockford resident named John Clifford gave a description of the fairgrounds to the Rockford Register in 1939. The games were played on the fairgrounds, and the poorer field, to my mind, has never been known. The catcher was hemmed in by trees with the exception of a space about 30 by 50 feet. 
The umpire could not see a foul unless he hit the back of the plate or a few feet on either side of the baselines. Between the plate and second base, the terrain was fairly level, but approaching third base, there was a noticeable rise, and from third to the plate, there was a depression, and the base runner had to dig in for life. The bleachers made of a planking from a torn down bridge seated between 300 and 500 people. The Tribune in 1870 wasn't quite as harsh a critic. The ground was nicely adapted for ball playing, barring a slight elevation in right field and numerous trees just outside the foul lines toward the first and third bases. Old Rockford finally broke into the world win column officially with an 18-5 pounding of the New York Mutuals on July 31st. It was young Adrian Anson's first career five-hit game. A.M. Nichols of Rockford was selected as umpire. Nichols, an insurance man, had served as four city secretary and previously employed A.G. Spalding in his insurance office. You certainly won't find team secretaries filling in as umpires for their own games in the days. Four City Nine made it two in a row three days later in spectacular fashion. The game was scoreless until the seventh inning when a wild throw by Matthews let Hastings score. Cherokee Fisher tossed a complete, four, complete game four to nothing shutout. <clears throat> one of four shutouts in the entire NAA that season. And Fort Wayne was involved in all four. The Kepiangas shut out Cleveland in the first game of the season, May 4th. Then they were shut out by Al Spaulding of Boston, June 21st, by Randy Walters of New York on June 28th, and by Cherokee Fisher of Rockford on August 3rd. <clears throat> Cherokee William Fisher of Philadelphia, without a doubt, the swiftest pitcher in this country, and a gentleman who is well known as a very earnest and reliable player full of endurance and pluck and a first class batter will attend to the pitching department. This is this is the intro prior to the season. <clears throat> Fisher also played for the Troy Haymakers nine. <clears throat> in fact, there was a notable game in 1869 where Troy tied Cincinnati and almost put a blemish on their perfect 1869 season. Um, However, at the end, Captain Bill Kramer and team president Keon pulled the team off the field due to a disputed play. Or was it? There were some whispers that there was gambling interests involved. William Rychek and his excellent black guards and red stockings said, Fisher is a solid hurler and so went sober and an all around good player. We could fire the ball at the best of them. And that did not have Spalding's control, strategic ability, or offensive support. At least on one occasion, Fisher would be released from a team, presumably from drinking. The Chicago Tribune, even in 1875, noted Fisher depends on more speed than strategy. Fisher's NA career spanned five seasons for five teams. Baltimore Canaries in 